All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth installment of the Geek's Guide to the Workplace. Today, we're going to be focusing on a lot of great content about your content. My name is Brian Josephat. I'm a principal consultant with our America's Consulting Services based out of our central region in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Crystal Ricevito. I'm a senior product manager out of Raleigh. I've been at Citrix for almost six years, focused on content the entire time, ranging from I started out in tech support, I was a sales engineer, and now I'm your product manager. Yeah, I really like our team dynamic because we get to look at the product from two very different perspectives. Crystal working primarily on feature development, while I do a lot more post-sales design and implementation. So get to kind of see both sides of the spectrum. Yeah. So before we go ahead and jump into content, I just wanted to quickly recap what was covered during the third session of the Geek's Guide to the Workplace. So during that session, we were focusing on single sign-on to your web and SaaS apps. So specifically focused around the gateway service, being able to add uh, access control policies, as well as the secure browser service. If you weren't able to catch that, session. We are recording all of these sessions live, so you can go ahead and uh, look, watch them uh, after the fact on YouTube. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking here about your content, and specifically the content collaboration service. And we're going to be focusing around choice, so all the different types of data repositories you can use for your content, experience with Citrix files, the integration with virtual apps and desktops, as well as security with Citrix Analytics. So why are you all here? David Henshaw said it best, no workspace is complete without content. So we're going to talk a little bit about how content fits within your workspace. So to do that, we want to talk about what is it like today? Today, data is everywhere. Data fragmentation is absolutely real. Uh, someone else called it, I think it was PJ, called it an archaeological dig to be able to find your data. So what do we do about that? The traditional approach is that IT says, let's take all of this disparate data and let's migrate it into one spot. And the reason you would do that, of course, from an IT perspective is because then you have visibility into it. You have control instead of having things in all sorts of different places. But the reality is that's not what happens. A recent Gartner study showed that 83% of planned data migrations either fail or are significantly behind in their, uh, their calendar, their time, and go significantly over budget. We give you the option within Workspace to take all of that data uh, and use the Workspace as a platform to be able to access and collaborate on all of your data without having to actually move or migrate any of that data. So like Brian said, when we're talking about content collaboration, we always focus on three key things. And hopefully, this is a pattern for everything you've been hearing about with the workspace. We are very focused on your experience, giving users and IT the best experience possible. We focus, uh, focus very much on choice. And within all of that, we always have security as the uh, platform and the base for everything that we do. All right. I don't want to kill you fine folks with PowerPoints. Are you bored yet? A little bit, yes. Let's give the people what they want, which is demos. So before we can go ahead and show you the full Citrix files and content collaboration experience, we have to go ahead and add users in to give them access to, their, um, to the content collaboration service. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off here on our Citrix Cloud landing page. You can see in the middle here, we have our content collaboration service. Just one of the tiles of all the different services that we can go ahead and uh, provide to you from the single pane of glass. So jumping over here to the Users tab, you can see that you can either add an employee or client. And that's a key difference that I want to illustrate within this demo. So you can see here, we, have, we still have licenses that we can allocate to users. So we're good to go ahead and create an employee. So what I'm going to show you is creating just a, adding just a single employee, but I do want to mention that you can add multiple employees just either through Excel or a user management tool. So you don't have to necessarily do this all uh, at one user at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and add one of my hometown heroes, Mitchell Trubisky. If you don't know him, he's the Chicago Bears quarterback. Definitely want to make sure we give him plenty of access, given he's the uh, quarterback of the team. So. 
What, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through all of the different RBAC permissions that we can go ahead and provide to employees. You can see there's a wide range of different uh, permissions you can pr provide them for everything from billing to giving them access to create and manage storage zones. And you can also define what, which storage zone they have by default, so either cloud hosted or uh, locally. Lastly here, you can go ahead and assign users with pre-created folders, and you can add them to distribution. So this will automatically provide them with data, uh, data and folders that you already have created. And, um, and then you can go ahead and either notify them or just go ahead and let them know on the side. So you can see there within the employee creation uh, process, there's a lot of different permissions that you can add for those users. But when you, go, when you go ahead and create a client now, you see that you, you, can only, you can provide them either access to change their password or access their personal settings. You don't give them the whole list of permissions that you have within your internal corporate environment. Uh, so that's a key differentiator between the, two, between the two types of users. And then you can assign folders and add them to distribution lists consistent with how you can with an employee. So overall, very simple process, two different types of users. And like I mentioned, you can add users in bulk as well as you scale up with content collaboration. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about choice and why choice is important. So for me, when I talk about choice, what I'm talking about is flexibility. I want flexibility when I'm accessing my data. And so what you get with content collaboration with the workspace is pure choice in where your data resides and what data we're accessing. So content collaboration or Citrix files, when you're accessing that feature within the workspace, it's always going to be SaaS-based. So we're delivering to you best-in-class user experience. We're building and reporting. We handle all the SQL Server so you don't have to. When it comes to the data itself, though, you decide where that data is. Do you want to keep that data on-premises? Do you want to keep that data in the cloud? You can have a hybrid approach where you're utilizing both for different purposes. And we're also going to allow you to access other data, not just new data, but data that's already old and sitting in legacy network file shares or OneDrive for Business. You want to access that data from a single pane of glass. We're going to give you that single pane of glass so that you can access any of your data from the same site. No matter what device you're using, you're going to get that same user experience and nothing's off limits. So what does that look like for your users? Now that Brian's added users into the workspace, what do they see? So I'm going to give you a heads up on my, on, my pre, on my demo that I'm going to show, because demos are the best. But before I made my demo, I definitely had some coffee, and I'm going through it very quickly. So I'm going to give you a preview about some of the favorite things that I do in my preview, just so we can get ahead of that. You're going to see the unified workspace experience, and hopefully you all have seen that. Everyone's seen the workspace? Awesome. So we're going to go through the workspace and have access to all of our things. And then I'm going to share some files. I have lots of different access, uh, ways to share my files, uh, depending on what my use case is and my general preference as a user. I'm going to add security with view-only view sharing and watermarking. That way, I'm not giving people full ownership of those documents. Because once someone downloads a document, it's theirs. If we prevent them from being able to download it, they don't own it. And if something ever got out, it has a watermark. I know exactly where that leak came from. I'm also going to go through feedback and approval workflows, which is something that you may not be familiar with. And it's one of my favorite features. This is something that takes many, many emails out of my inbox, because collaboration and uh, talking about a specific document is all streamlined with these built-in workflows that we have. All right. Is everybody ready for the demo? I am. Woo! <laughs> so can I see a show of hands? Who has data that's on-premises? Who has, keep your hands up, who has data that's in the cloud? Who has data that's in OneDrive or Dropbox? And who has access to all of those things from one app? That's what I thought. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at how things could be if you had content collaboration within the workspace. All right, so here we are. Hopefully, you have seen the unified workspace where I have access to my apps, to my desktops, and most importantly, in this room at least, to my files. When I click on my files, I have access to lots of different repositories here. So you see that I have access to personal folders, to shared folders. And I want to point out my network file shares. 
So these are my home drives. I did not have to lift them up. I did not have to migrate them. I did not have to move them. These are specifically for me. I have access to my home drive, and I can access that data, and I can share it out, which we all know is very difficult. I also have access to Dropbox because IT provided that for me so I can access my pictures. And OneDrive for Business is something that's provided. So if I want to add watermarking on top of the things that I have there, it's an option for me. So Brian and I have been working on this presentation for a couple of weeks, and I decided we should collaborate better than emails when we're sharing this document. So I'm going to create a folder, and I have the ability to create that folder myself. So an administrator doesn't have to be super hands-on on who has access to all of these things. I have the ability to create this. And also, as an administrator on this account, I can choose where I store it. So I can make it on-prem, or I can store it in the cloud. So I created this folder, and it's adding new documents into this as easy as drag and drop. So I'm going to upload and have some, uh, what, not Matrix, what am I thinking of? Inception, that's yeah. the movie. So we're incepting my, uh, my presentation in here. Uh, and now that I have access to that, I have options of how we should collaborate, right? So I can add people to this folder. Just being an administrator, I created this folder. It's my folder. I can do with it whatever I want. So I'm going to add Brian to this folder. Um, so I can start typing in his name. He's already there. Or I could add an entire distribution group. So if I wanted the landscaping team to be able to see this as opposed to the plumbing team, uh, I can add that entire Active Directory user group to this folder and give people access and control what they can do with it. Instead of adding him to that folder, I changed my mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it over to him directly. I don't want to add him to the folder. I have the option of getting a link. Getting a link is super convenient because we use Slack in the office. So now I can send him a secure link over Slack. Change my mind again. I might want to give him view-only permissions, so I'm going to send him an email through, through Citrix files where I can change his permission. Instead of full control, you see I have the option of view online with watermark. That way, he can't share this document to anyone else. And I can also say he can only access it for a very limited period of time. If you don't access it within 30 days, <laughs> too bad. You can only download it twice. If you want it more, you let me know. Um, I can also always link to the latest version of this file. So if I send it off to him and then I quickly make a change, um, when he clicks on that link, he's always going to see the changes that I've made to that document. So we're keeping the versioning fresh. Change my mind again. I don't want to actually send that link. I don't want to send an email. I want to have more of a feedback approach. I want you to give me some feedback. Maybe I have multiple people on here. But I want to be able to track these changes. So I initiate this workflow. And I'm going to click Collect Feedback, because you're not in charge of me. You can't approve. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to set a due date on this. Let's set it for my birthday, June 30th. And we'll add Brian to this. All right. So I add him. I can add an entire team of people. Again, if I've got my user groups in there and I want the entire marketing team to all give me feedback, that's something I definitely can do. I pull up the document. And what we're going to do is initiate that, that correspondence so you and I can uh, collaborate here. Now, normally, Brian would be the one that's making comments on this and is making annotations. But for demo purposes, I'm going to leave some comments ready for him to go. So I'm going to type in whatever it is that I want to say. And I'm going to have some color-coded things that say, I'm making these comments. You can reply. You can mark it as something that's been resolved. And then we can upload new versions. So everyone that has access to this is working off of the same version and seeing what's the latest and greatest. We're not doing emails back and forth. So I can see on that feedback pane any of the annotations. So if I want to go back and see the history of all people that are collaborating on here, who said what, what changes uh, are people requesting, I can see that. And within the workspace, I can go to that pane and see all of the feedback and approval workflows that are currently in process. If you're not responding quick enough, I can also send you a gentle reminder that you need to go ahead and provide that feedback to me. How easy was that? Wow. I see a lot of head shaking, which <laughs> makes me feel good. What's great about that demo is that was about four minutes long, and there, I had so many different options of how I wanted to collaborate with Brian. Whatever worked best for us in that scenario is all options to me, which makes the flexibility really important within the workspace. I couldn't tell you how many documents I have that have versions with underscore final, underscore final, version six. Mm -hmm. It's uh, too, way too many emails back and forth and not enough collaboration on the same document there. For sure. So within that demo, I showed you a lot of features, but there are a couple that I didn't show that I also wanted to bring up because they're really, really neat and things that I use all the time. E-signatures, 
are awesome. I use this personally. Sorry, Citrix. I use my I use my account because I want e-signatures. I think this is a fantastic tool because I do not have a printer. Does anyone in this room have a printer in their home? Cool. Okay, we've got a couple of hands. But the idea of someone telling me to print, sign, scan, and return a document is just something that does not fly with me or any of my friends. So having e-signature is something that, from a, collaborat from a collaborative standpoint, is definitely going to be useful for millennials, Gen Z, people <laughs> in the workplace. Another feature is online viewing and co-editing. So most of us have Office 365 licenses, and we want to be able to co-edit. So a collaborative feature is where I can be working on it, and Brian at the same time can be making changes simultaneously. That way, it's always saving back, and we have version and control to make sure that we always have the latest version of the document. I also wanted to point out what I showed you was the web app version of Workspace. But users that are used to uh, having virtual environments, they may be more accustomed to using their Windows Explorer. Um, they're using a Mac OS. We have a Citrix Files app that allows you to access all of those files from a different type of perspective. You still have access to all of those great data sources. And now you can actually trigger out some of those critical workflows that you, normally you would have to do from a web application. You can do it straight out of the Citrix Files app. Looks great to me. Yeah. So now that I show you how we set that, uh, how we use it, Brian's going to show us how we set it up. So one last poll of the audience: How many of you have used or are using any of these Citrix products? Virtual apps and desktops, Zen apps and desktop, Presentation Server, MetaFrame, WinFrame. I'm sure everyone at some point has used one of these products. So how does content collaboration fit into these uh, virtualization products? So the great news is it fits in perfectly. There's just a couple things we uh, want to take into account to make sure that things are working smoothly and working as, uh, as streamlined as we can. So one of the biggest considerations when we're using a virtualization environment is working with non-persistent machines. So let's say we're working with a non-persistent VDI model, where we have a pool of VDIs. Every time a user logs in, they get a new, fresh machine. They log off, it reboots. So one benefit of cloud storage today is, it, is they allow you to take files and mark them as offline. It's great because it gives you local experience. However, this becomes an issue when you start to work with non-persistent machines, because you go to log in, all of those files that you had marked as offline have to get downloaded to your machine. Now, this is a problem uh, in two, in, uh, for, two way, for two reasons. First, there is increased time to log in, as well as increased time to be able to launch your applications. So a login hit, as well as a in increased resource consumption, because you're having to actually download all of those files. There's going to be increased. Uh, resource utilization on that uh, pooled VDI that you're on. So you, you have to take those two hits the first time you log in. Next time you log into a new machine, it's the same process. You have to go ahead and download those, those, or those files again. And it's the same thing every time you log in. So how do we address this with Citrix files? What we do is we go ahead and we take that cloud-based storage and we place it in a storage zone. Now, what we can do is we can designate pointers that point to that cloud-hosted store, cloud storage. And then uh, you're not actually having to download all of those files upon logon. Instead, with all these pointers, you go ahead and launch a file. And it's, that single file is pulled down upon a click. So it gives you the on-demand access of files without having to download all those files uh, every time you need to log in. Overall, a huge, huge benefit with the non-persistent use case, which is what I generally see deployed out in the field. So how else does content collaboration help out with virtual apps and desktop, Zen app and Zen desktop? So you know, on top of the on-demand access of files, the, one, of the, one of my favorite features of Citrix files with virtual apps and desktop is the single interface. So Crystal mentioned earlier about the OneDrive for business integration. This is huge when you get to a server-based model, 
because the OneDrive for business client isn't natively supported with non-persistent server OS machines. So there's some considerations there about integration with um, bringing your OneDrive for business feature set, a uh, native feature set, into a virtual apps and desktop environment. So with Citrix files, you can see here, you can go ahead and map a OneDrive for business uh, repository as a drive, as if it's native within your uh, file explorer. That's a huge benefit that, uh, that can be used, especially in a virtual apps environment where you um, want to be able to get the multi-user tenancy uh, on your machines. So those two, those two uh, features are huge when you're looking at virtual apps and desktop and bringing your data into those sessions. Now, again, we want to make sure we're, we're not giving you death by PowerPoint with all of our slides, so let's jump into a couple more demos. So how do we go ahead and add Citrix files into virtual apps and desktop image? I do want to add one preface. It's not the most exciting demo, but that's on purpose because it's very simple and uh, something that takes almost no time at all. And It's so easy. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> So what we're, going to go, what we're going to do here is first install the Citrix files for uh, Windows client. Uh, I promise I did read all of those terms and conditions. I did cut, cut that section out. Don't worry about that. So in just a couple seconds here, we can go ahead and install Citrix files. I'm also going to go ahead and install the Citrix files for Outlook client, which provides integration with, with Outlook and allows you to initiate workflows directly from uh, your Outlook, your native Outlook client. Now, in order to provide some of those benefits that we mentioned with virtual apps and desktop, we'll want to apply a couple of group policies. Now, here I'm going to be showing you how this policy are applied just in the local policy on the machine. However, you can, of course, apply these at the AD group policy level. So what I'm doing here is I'm copying our ADMX and ADML templates into the appropriate repositories. Confirm that once I copied them in, we can see them there, SFWIN, great. Now we can jump into our local group policy editor, editor and set up those policies. So uh, here you can see our Citrix files ADMX template, and there's a couple policy settings I want to call out. The first one here at the bottom, uh, enable application, is critical when, um, in order to launch the application upon logon. So every time a user logs on, you want to make sure that the Citrix files client is launched so they can use it right away. They don't have to manually go and click that file. And the other policy I want to call out right in the middle here is the enable offline access. This is the policy that you want to disable in order to take advantage of that pointer capability where users aren't allowed to mark files as offline. And then instead, they're just accessing those files on demand when they need them which helps in the non-persistent uh, uh, use cases. You can also specify specific mount points, which I don't show here, but that's where you would go ahead and set up those drives, like that OneDrive O, dr OneDrive o uh, drive that I, I, we showed in the last slide. So overall, very simple, couple minutes, and you are all set up to run Citrix files within your virtual apps and desktop image. So let's take a look at what that looks like for the end user. So as a user, I have access, of course, to my Windows Explorer. And like you just showed on the slide, I have my Citrix files, my S drive, and you have this single pane of glass, access to all of those things that I had within the web app. So same account where I have access to my personal folders. Within this app, I can trigger those uh, actions so I can request files. I can securely send files. I can also securely request them. Um, and I can also share it out the same way with Citrix files or getting a secure link. Now, I didn't disable checkout because I'll show you in a second. I'm going to brag on myself. But we've got more options where we can open it within Workspace. And then those network file shares, those home drives I have access to. So within this Synergy folder, a brand new feature we just released is that we now offer check-in, check-out for our on-premises network file shares, which is definitely something people have been asking for a long time. I see heads nodding, which makes me feel good. This is something we were asking for, and it now exists. All right. Pretty easy, huh? Awesome. 
So now that we understand what content collaboration can do, what Citrix files look like, what does this look like from a security perspective? How do we make sure our data is safe? And how do we, yeah, how do we address this big kind of open question? So we, we mentioned we have all these different repositories. We have our on-premise repositories. We have our cloud hosted repositories. And there's different controls that are operate around those different types of data. So there's potential for data to become vulnerable when you have when you're managing your on-premise uh, data differently from your cloud data, differently from your personal data. So how can we address this? I mean, in a perfect world, what we would do is we'd go ahead and lay a perimeter around all these different repositories and then be able to ap apply policies and get visibility into information about what's happening with those repositories. What a great idea. I think we should go ahead and uh, send that up the chain with PM. Yeah. So that's exactly what analytics can help us do. So we secure your content with Citrix Analytics. We're not going to go deep into it because we're focused on content, but I will put a plug in for the analytics uh, part of this Geek Speak works, uh, Geek's Guide to the Workshop. It's part 10, and it's tomorrow at 4.30. Um, let me go back. But what, something that's cool about it, we go back to the other one. Thank you. He has the back button. I don't. What's cool <laughs> about this is that we don't just do reporting within the Citrix analytics. So traditionally, you would be able to look at reports. You would be able to see um, what people have been doing. And then you could react to it. You could respond. You could say, this seems unusual. And you could go and investigate. But what's special about Citrix analytics is we're going to be building user profiles based on what's normal for your activity. So when things start being anomalous, we can detect that. So someone who only usually shares, I don't know, 10 documents a day, suddenly sharing 150, that might be strange. And so an IT professional can see that and make a decision on what to do. So they could block that user from being able to log in, and they could even disable all those links that they shared out, making sure that we're mitigating any type of data loss. All right, so in summary of what you've seen here, Hopefully what you've gathered is what resonated really well with me at the keynote, that if we make things easier, you're getting productivity back. What I was hoping to focus on in this is that the experience and the choice that you have here is going to save you tons of time and effort. If you make things easy for your end users, and if you make things easy for security and for IT, we're getting that extra day of productivity back. And I'm hoping that that's everybody's takeaway. So we're going to go ahead and uh talk about a couple next steps. Definitely want to save some time for questions, but did want to call out in, uh, if you've been following this Geek's Guide to the Workspace uh, series, I did want to call out that the next uh, session is around endpoint manage, management and how we handle working with all of, your, all of your mobile devices. So that's one that you definitely do not want to miss. I know it's been a pretty hot topic there. And then, also, I did want to call out, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with our Citrix Tech Zone, but it's become our go-to repository for all of our um, Citrix verified design deployment guides and technical expertise. I know... Uh, we just recent, yeah, we just recently posted a reference architecture for on-premises storage zones, so if that's something you're interested in, it is live. And we'll be posting one soon on deploying the same storage zones within Azure. All right, at this time, we want to take questions from the crowd. So if you have any questions, if you can go up to a microphone, we would appreciate that. A brave soul. Hmm. You look lonely up there, so. Thanks. Um, so this looks great. We happen to just acquire a company that has been using this. What are the options available for migrating from one tenant to another, for example? Because I love for the acquiring company to be able to use this, but we can't continue to use the old infrastructure or, or services. I promise he's not a plant in the audience. <laughs> but this is a great question. So one of the features that I have recently built as a product manager is actually a share file to share file migration tool. So just in time for your specific use case, we will have a service where we'll be able to migrate not just the data, uh, retaining all of the folder structures, but also all of the users, and most importantly, all of the user permissions on those folders. So if that's something that you're interested in, stay after and take my card, and we can talk about it. Okay.
Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the crowd? Quiet group, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I hope you guys gained something from this. Uh, really appreciate it, and stay tuned for the next episode of The Geek's Guide. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>